Last week as we began this series in the Gospel of Mark, Mark set the stage for Jesus. He set the stage by quoting the Old Testament and saying that somebody was going to come and prepare the way for the Messiah. And he says, and that's this guy named John the Baptist. He came to teach people about repenting of their sins and turning to God and being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And so he set the stage for Jesus. And he did that because what we believe determines how we live. What you and I believe about Jesus is going to affect the way that we live life when we're out in the community. If we believe that Jesus is God's son, that he, uh, it's his death that brought us the forgiveness of sins, then we're going to live differently and we're going to live lives to honor him. If we don't believe who Jesus is, then it really isn't going to have much of an effect on us. But this week... Jesus is going to trade places with somebody. Have you ever thought about trading places with people? Have you ever thought about that? Look at somebody else and thought, man, they got the life. If I, if I could be them, I would love to be them. I had a chance to minister with my dad uh, in Northern Virginia. He was the preacher and I was the youth minister. And we just had this running joke between the two of us about which one worked harder than the other one. And I would go in his office and I would sit down and I'd say, well, you know what? Listen, your job is so easy. You know, we had one service. I'm like, you preach one time and every once in a while you do a Bible study or a small group and you might have to go to the hospital. And, and it's like people didn't die in Northern Virginia. So he did like 10 funerals the entire 13 years he was there. And I was like, you just don't, you got it made. I wish I had your job. I would love to have your job. Be simple. And he'd just sit back in his chair, and put his finger on his face like this, and he'd say, uh-huh. Well, let's just talk about your job. You get to go to pool parties and pizza parties. You teach kids how to ice skate, and I don't know, you teach them a lesson every once in a while. You know, I mean, really, and this is what he said to me. He said, I would rather have your job than a license to steal. And I was like, really? Okay, well, at least I do, you know. And so we would just have fun, go back and forth with each other and, and talk about how you don't work hard. No, 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 you're the one that doesn't work hard. It's easy to look at other people's situations and say, I wish I was that person. I wish I had their life. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever thought, I wish I had that person's life? Maybe you'd like to be Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. They are billionaires multi-times, okay? And you go, man, if I had all that money, life would be perfect. I would like to be them. Or, or maybe you'd like to be a famous athlete. Maybe Steph Curry or LeBron James, Dale Earnhardt Jr. or Tom Brady. And maybe it's one of those. You go, man, if I could be them, life would be good. Or maybe for you it was an actor or an actress. And you thought, to be in movies or on TV, man, that's the way. It, that would just be awesome. Or maybe it's a musician, you think, if I could trade places with a musician and, and go around the world singing songs that I love to sing and, and people just adoring you, that would be awesome. Have you ever thought, and I would like to trade with somebody? Now, I want you to do this. I want you to just take about 30 seconds, and I want you to tell somebody beside you who it was that at one time you said, I wish I could trade with that person. Now, you may have to go back to when you were a kid, and you looked up to somebody, and you thought, man, if I could be them, that's who I would trade with, all right? So somebody beside you, in front of you, behind you, whatever, tell them somebody you would like to trade lives with them. Now, what I'm hoping is that not like two-thirds of you are going, I want to trade with Tim because he doesn't do anything. He works a day and a half a week, okay? It, it's easy, though, for us to look at other people and think, man, they've got it made. Their life is so good. If I could trade with them, man, my life would be so much better. And we're going to talk today about trading. But we're going to talk about Jesus trading with somebody you would never expect him to trade lives with. And I think if we'll dig a little deep, it's going to make an impression on us today. Now listen, I can't go verse by verse through the book of Mark. If I did that, it would probably take us a year or 18 months to get through the entire book of Mark, the, the gospel account that Mark writes for us. So what I'm going to have to do is give you the Cliff Notes version of some parts of it to where we can get to the main part that we want to talk about. So I'm going to pick up where we left off last week and, and just kind of fill you in and bring you up to date of where we are in the passage that we're going to cover today. And this is from 
Mark chapter 1. But you remember when we ended last week, Jesus had began preaching and teaching, uh, and uh, he was telling people, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And so he was sharing that with them. Well, he begins to put a team together, a team of people that are going to help him in his mission, in his ministry. And so he goes by the seashore and he finds four guys, Peter and Andrew, who were brothers and fishermen, and James and John, who were brothers and fishermen. And Jesus goes to him and he says, hey, come follow me and I will teach you how to fish for people. And that's exactly what they did. They left their nets, they left their family, and they began to follow Jesus. They followed Jesus right to the synagogue. And Jesus goes into the synagogue and he begins to preach and teach. And the people are all amazed. And scripture says it's all of them. They are amazed at how Jesus is preaching. They've never heard teaching like this before. Well, one man stands up. And scripture describes him as having an unclean spirit. And he has this unclean spirit and he stands up and he says, what do you want with us, Jesus? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. It says Jesus got angry. He looked at him and he said, come out of that man. It says with a streak, the, the streak, the spirit left and, and just left him. And the people were then totally blown away. They're like, wait a minute, this guy teaches with incredible authority, but now he's able to tell demons what to do? He just speaks and that demon leaves. And it says that news about Jesus spread all over that region. He was the talk of the town and the areas that he was in. That's pretty amazing. Well, he gets with Peter and Andrew, James and John, and he goes to Peter's house. And they go to just have some time there, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And they tell Jesus this, his mother-in-law is sick. He walks in, he grabs her by the hand, helps her up, and she's perfectly healed. And she begins to wait on him, fix him dinner. And when the word gets out that Jesus is doing these kind of things, it says that people came from everywhere with all kinds of diseases and illnesses and problems, and Jesus just starts healing them. And he's healing person after person after person after person, and he's driving out demons. He's driving out this demon, and this demon, and this demon, and he's just doing all these phenomenal things, and, and everybody's getting healed. Some people believe that Jesus almost eradicated sickness from the Jewish people that he was preaching to because he just healed all of their diseases. Well, imagine if he's done that all day. I would think that would have to take a lot out of you. So it says early the next morning he went off to a solitary place because he wanted to pray and he wanted to spend some time with his dad, with God. I don't think he had gotten away very long when Peter comes running up and goes, Jesus, listen, everybody's looking for you. They want to know where you are. And Jesus said, okay, well then, let's travel. Let's go to some nearby villages and let's do the same thing we've been doing here. Let's teach them about my father and let's heal. And that's what he did. He continued to heal people and to cast out demons. I mean, Jesus is the man of the day. He's the man of the hour. People are coming from everywhere to hear him talk about God and to see the amazing things that he's going to do. Big man on campus doing great things and people are responding to him. And now we get to the part of our story, the part of this account in Mark chapter 1 that I want us to concentrate on today. If you've got your Bibles, would you turn to Mark chapter 1? Mark chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 40. We're only going to read a few verses here, but this is an amazing, amazing story that I hope is really going to teach us today as Jesus sets the stage for what his ministry and his mission is going to look like. Mark chapter 1, and let's begin in verse 40. It says, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. 
Now that's a story maybe that you've heard for years. Maybe this is the, the 50th time you've heard this story. And yet if we could really understand what's going on here, we are going to learn so much about the nature of Jesus and the ministry that he wanted to have when he was here. And so I, I just need to explain to you a little bit about what leprosy is. Because for you to fully understand and grasp the story, you have to know this disease called leprosy because it affected people physically, mentally, and spiritually. Physically, how did it affect them? Well, it was a skin disease. That's where it started. And it wasn't like blisters or sores that you can imagine. What happened was when they got leprosy, and leprosy comes from the lepre bacteria. The, the word leprosy comes from the root word lepus, which means scaly. What happened was your nerve endings died. And so you could not feel things in the extremities of your body. The warning system of pain goes away. And you simply can't feel. And so you might cut yourself and you don't think very much about it. It doesn't seem like a bad cut. But it progresses. And because it doesn't hurt, you don't do anything about it. And it gets worse and it gets worse. Or you may cut yourself significantly or even lose a part uh, of the end of a finger or the end of a toe. And it's not that big of a deal. So it doesn't hurt. And so it gets infected. And it begins to just deteriorate. And this begins to spread throughout your body because you can't feel anymore. And when that starts to happen to your body, your skin starts to change and your skin becomes tumorous, bumpy and, 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 and just jagged looking. And imagine kind of like a cauliflower all over a person's face to where you can't even hardly see who they are. Uh, you can't tell that their hands are their hands because they're just drawn up and they've lost parts of them. And just imagine physically what this would have looked like to a person. Now, it only affect, not only affected the outside, it affected the internal organs as well because they would begin to break down because of infection and because of this bacteria. And often, leprosy would lead to blindness because a person could get just a piece of sand or dirt in their eye. They couldn't tell it was there because they can't feel their nerve endings are dead, and so they wouldn't get it out. You and I, if we get something in our eye, what do we do? We get water, we get something, we try to get that out of there. They wouldn't, and so it would just scrape and scrape and scrape their eye, and they could go blind. So imagine all of these physical things that are happening to them. Their body is wasting away. They don't even look human a lot of the time. And that's how it's affecting them. And people believe that the, this disease was spread by either them breathing on you or just the wind blowing against them and carrying their germs over to you. And so there was a very strict policy given in the Bible for how a person with leprosy is supposed to be dealt with. Listen as I read from Leviticus chapter 13. It says, anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of the face, and cry out unkept unclean unclean as long as they have the disease they remain unclean they must live alone they must live outside the camp you can you imagine how terrible this was this was not only a physical thing this was a mental thing because if you were declared unclean that meant you couldn't be around your family you couldn't be around your friends you couldn't be around society at all and you had to wear torn clothes. You had to let your hair grow out and be unkept. You had to wear a cloth from just below your eyes down so that you didn't breathe on anybody else. It was so bad that if you were upwind from a leper, a leper could come within 25 feet of you, upwind. But if you were downwind, a leper had to stay 150 feet away from people. Can you imagine how that would weigh on your mind? How you had to walk around, you had to scream, unclean, unclean. And when people saw you coming, they ran. Because they didn't want this disease that you had. And you imagine what that does to your mind. They're ostracized, they're outcast. They cannot have a part with anybody anymore. In fact, lepers were banned from even going into Jerusalem. Any walled city, lepers were banned from going inside of those. And imagine how that would weigh on your mind. I've heard people compare leprosy with AIDS. And they've said AIDS is the modern day leprosy in our society. I can understand what they're saying, but listen, I disagree with that because I've never seen a person walk with a t-shirt on that says, I have AIDS. 
and walk around going, I'm unclean, I have AIDS, stay away from me. We don't treat them that way in our society, do we? And yet that's exactly how they were treated in biblical days. I'm unclean, stay away from me. It affected them physically. Their bodies just deteriorated. It affected them mentally because they were told all the time that you can't be around people. And they were even told that they had been cursed by God. You've done something so bad. God is so angry with you that he's just going to put this disease on you to separate you from people. But it affected them spiritually because they said, and now you're separated from God. You see, a person who was unclean, that was declared unclean by the priest, could not go to the temple. They could not go in a synagogue. They could not worship. They could not make a sacrifice to God. They couldn't participate in Passover or uh, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Or They could not be a Jew. They were told, you are separated from the people, but you are separated from God. God doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, you're separated from your family and society is one thing, but for them to tell you that God doesn't want to have anything to do with you either? Imagine how that just tore at the fabric of who they were. Family, that's leprosy. That's as bad of a disease as you possibly could have. And that's what this man has. That's what makes verse 40 so significant when it says a leper came to Jesus. You don't do that as a leper. If you are unclean, you don't approach anybody. I mean, you can get in a lot of trouble for that. You stayed away from people. You had been taught that. You yelled unclean. And yet this man boldly came to Jesus, fell at his knees, and begged him. You're not supposed to do that. How desperate do you have to be to say, I don't care what society says. I don't care what these people do. They can stone me to death. I've got to take a chance. And so he came to Jesus. And then he says to him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I love that because that is a huge story of faith that we skip over. He didn't say, you know, I kind of hear you can heal people. Don't know if you can heal a leper, but man, if you'd give it a whirl, I would love for you to give it a try. No, this leper came to him, he begged him, and he said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You can heal me. And as unnerving as it is for us to think about somebody that's got this horrible disease coming up to clean people, coming up and giving them a chance of being declared unclean and them not being able to go to the temple or be with their family. As, as astonishing as that is, it is more unnerving what Jesus does in response. Now, the first part of verse 41 says Jesus was indignant. Now, your version might say Jesus had compassion on him. And that sounds a lot better. We like the idea that he was compassionate, right? But the word really translated is he was indignant. He was angry. And you're thinking, well, he should have been angry. The man could have made him unclean. That's not why Jesus was angry. He wasn't angry at the man. He was angry at the disease. He was angry at the, the fact that this man had been separated from society. And even more than that, he had been separated from God. And that made Jesus angry. He's angry at the leprosy. But what does he do that blows our minds? It's absolutely astonishing. Scripture says he reaches out and he touches him. Do you guys understand how huge that is? You don't want to be breathed on by a leper, much less touched. And in Tim's world, I can't prove this scripturally, but I don't believe Jesus put his hand on his shoulder. I don't believe he grabbed his hand. I believe he cupped that man's ha face in his hands. And he got right up in his face and he said, I'm willing. Be clean. He wanted the people to see that even though this man was diseased, even though they thought he was an outcast, God still loved him. I'm willing. Be clean. And what does it say in that next verse? Immediately. He's clean. Not over a week, over a month. His sores dried up. It, no, no, no. Immediately he was clean. I believe if he lost fingers, they came back. If he lost toes, they came back. If his nose had fallen off or his ears had fallen off, they came back. And I think his skin was as smooth as a baby's skin. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? 
Little babies, their skin is so smooth and perfect. And I believe that's what that man's skin was like. Now, when Jesus reached out and touched him, can you hear the crowd? <gasps> oh my goodness, what is he doing? Maybe the disciples said, Jesus, you don't touch a leper. That's not acceptable. It's not okay. Don't touch him. And now those gasps have changed to, wow, did you see that? And can you see word spreading through the crowd? Maybe people that couldn't see it. He healed a leper. He healed a leper. He touched him. And now he's clean. And can you imagine the reaction of that leper? Man, I bet that dude, he hawed, hollered, yelled. In my mind, I just picture him grabbing Jesus and giving him a big old bear hug. Maybe even kissing him on the cheek and going, man, this is amazing. I'm clean and showing. I bet he's high-fiving everybody around him. Look, I'm clean. You guys know what I used to look like, but this man touched me, and now I'm clean. Gosh, I would have loved to have been there to watch that man's reaction. His worst day became his best day ever. And then what does Jesus say to him? What does Jesus say to him in that next verse? He simply says to him, what, what, what he gives it in verse 43, it says, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. Now listen, you need to understand, a strong warning, it's the idea of a horse snorting or stomping at you. If a horse does that to you, he's telling you, you better stay away. Don't get on me, I will buck you. Don't walk behind me, I'm going to kick you. Okay, so Jesus has given this man a very, very strong warning. And what does he say to him? He says, see to it that you don't tell this to anyone. Well, come on, really? Does anybody else find that just a little bit disturbing? That Jesus would say to this guy, I know I just gave you the best day of your life. I know you're clean and you can be back in contact with people and in contact with God. But don't tell anybody. Does anybody else think that's an impossible thing to ask? I'm going, if Jesus asked me that, I'd be like, I, I can't imagine that. But Jesus says, listen, don't tell anybody, but go to the temple, go to the synagogue, make a sacrifice, sacrifice Moses said, so that people will know you're clean. And the priest will declare you clean. Now we say, why in the world would Jesus say don't tell anybody? I mean, greatest news ever. But see, what you've got to understand is the Jews were not expecting just, just a teacher just a, a, a rabbi. They were expecting a Messiah, a king that was going to come and pull them out from under the oppression of the Romans, the Roman Empire. They were expecting a king that's going to come in and wipe everybody out. The Jews were once again, again going to be God's chosen people and they were going to rule over themselves and everybody around them. That's what the people wanted and that's not why Jesus came. They weren't ready to hear why he, why he was there. They weren't ready to understand that he came to serve, not to be served. That he came to fix their relationship with God, not fix their relationship with Rome. Had nothing to do with that, and they weren't ready. And that's why he said, don't tell them. You're going to bring attention that I don't need right now, because that's not why I'm here. So it's not that he didn't want him to celebrate. He had to know what amazing thing he had done for him. But he said, the people aren't ready. And that's why he said to him sternly, don't tell people. Just keep this right here with the ones that saw what happened. Don't tell anybody else. But then if you read verse 45, which is our key verse today, what's the first word? It <laughs> sounds like a kid, doesn't it? You tell them what to do. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. But family, can we blame him? Best day ever. And I know you're probably going, if Jesus told me to do something, I'd do it. I'd listen to what Jesus said. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, you would not. You're, you have been ostracized and outcast from society, and now you're back in. You would tell everybody that you know. So we can't blame him for that, but look at what happens. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. See, Jesus traded places with the leper. See, Jesus was teaching. He was preaching. He was healing people. And crowds are coming in droves. And they're going, wow, there's something special about this man. He was an insider. He was the one that everybody wanted to be around. The leper, on the other hand, he's as outside as outside can get. He's not allowed in towns. He's not allowed in cities. He has to stay away from people. He has to scream unclean. He, he is an outcast and an outsider unlike any other person could be in the nation 
of Israel. But what did Jesus do? He traded places. The leper became an insider. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I bet he was invited to every dinner that people had in the area. Hey, will you come and tell your story? Because this is crazy. Nobody's going to believe it. So he's getting invited over for dinners, and he's telling people the story. And he's like, you're not going to believe this, man. I was tore up. I mean, I was just horrible. And then this man, he just touched me, and I was immediately made clean. He's now an insider. He's back with his family, his friends, a job, just a part of life again. And then what does Scripture say about Jesus? But he stayed out side in lonely places because people wouldn't give him a break people were coming to him at all times because they knew what he could do so they switched places and I look at that story and I go wow that is beautiful that is amazing what Jesus would do for that man to trade places so that man could have a relationship with people and God once again. But you know that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I? Do you realize that Jesus traded places with us? 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 21 says, And God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might be the righteousness of God. God took Jesus, who was perfect, who never sinned, and he made him sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. At the end of that verse, it says this. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Purifies, cleans. So here's the bottom line. Here's the thing that I want you to get today that this story should teach us. And it's simply this. Jesus became sin so we could become clean. Jesus became sin so that you and I could become clean. Jesus traded places with us. What should Jesus have had? Jesus should have been worshipped, praised, adored. He should have stayed in heaven with God. He should have been uh, worshipped by the angels. Every need that he had taken care of, that's what Jesus deserved. But what did Jesus get? He got to be born as a baby. He got to grow up and start a ministry and be perfect and never sin. And yet the people turned their back on him. And they murdered him by nailing him to a cross. That's what Jesus got. You and I, what do we deserve? We deserve to be punished. We deserve to be separated from God forever because all of us have sinned. All of us have gone our own way. We've said, God, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do. And because of that, you and I should be separated from God forever. That's what we deserve. But what do we get we get the forgiveness of sins because of the death of Jesus. We get the promise of an eternity with God because of what Jesus did. See, Jesus became sin so you and I could become clean. And that blows my mind, family, that Jesus would do that for me and that Jesus would do that for you. See, the reason Jesus came was to trade places with us. To take on our sin, to take on our punishment so we can be clean. So that we don't have to be separated from God. So that one day, when we draw our last breath, or when Jesus comes back, we can stand before God and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because you and I worked hard, not because we deserved or earned it, but because Jesus traded places with us. Jesus became sin so that you and I could become clean. Would you bow your heads? Father, thank you that you didn't leave us to our own demise. You didn't leave us in our own filth and dirtiness but that you gave us Jesus to trade places with us, to take our sin, to take our punishment and make a way for us. And I thank you for the gift of salvation that Jesus offers. 
And I pray that when we look in the mirror, that we see someone that you love so much, that you sent your son for me and for each person that's here. Help us to keep that in the front of our mind and to share that with people around us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you feel real dirty. You feel like you are just covered in sin. And if you've never accepted Jesus, you are. You're covered in your sin. You're covered in your own filth. And there's nothing you can do about it. But God loved you so much, He allowed Jesus to become sin so you could become clean. What you need to do is accept that gift of Jesus. If you believe that he's God's son, you're willing to repent of your sins, you can go into that baptistry, be baptized, and that water represents the blood of Jesus that washes every one of your sins away. You become a brand new creature, a brand new creation because of what Jesus does for you. And there's no greater decision that you can make in your life because you become clean. And when God cleans you, you are clean indeed. So if you need to make that decision, how about today? Or maybe you're here and you just, you've been a Christian for a long time, but you, you're kind of like a pig. You know what I mean? You know how pigs are. You can clean them up. You can give them a bath. But what do they do? Go right back to the mud as soon as you get them clean. And sometimes that's us, isn't it? God cleans us. And then we go, but I had so much fun in the mud, God. And you jump back in there. And before long, you're just up to your neck, isn't it? You don't know how to get clean again. So you ask God and you say, God, help me to be clean. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in me. And maybe you need to talk to God about that today or maybe you need to come forward and us pray for you and we'd be happy to do that. And listen, we're, we're willing to pray with you publicly or privately. If you come tell us what's going on, we'll surround you with this church family and we'll pray for you. If you'd rather just pray privately, then we've got elders that'll be up in the front and, and you can just come and talk to them and they'll just pray with you right there where you are. But we want you to be able to give your request to God if that's what you want to do. And then if you want to be a part of this church family, if you're a baptized believer, we'll welcome you. And listen, we work together to connect to God, grow in faith, live to serve. We try to help each other to be clean, to be close to God, to be close to Jesus so that people in our community can see Jesus living in us. So now's your time to make a decision. Jesus became sin so that we could become clean. Have you accepted that gift? We're going to use hymn number 416, Footsteps of Jesus. And we're going to sing one stanza of this hymn. And so if you have a need or a decision, would you come as we stand together and as we sing? Thank you.